when do you ever half ask anything you care about? You don't, right. right? You just don't. So now suddenly you're doing it for a reason that you think you should, but it, it's not aligned to anything you, that matters to you. You're not going to be good at it. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Today, my guest is Dr. Todd Rose. Todd has an incredible life story. He was born in Ogden, Utah, where he became a college dropout. He was married with two kids on welfare, and he ended up finishing a degree in psychology at Weber State University before going on to earn a master's and a PhD at Harvard, where he spent a decade as a professor. Todd is the co-founder and president of Populous, a nonprofit organization dedicated to transforming how we learn, work, and live so that all people have the opportunity to live a fulfilling life. During his 10 years at Harvard, Todd founded the Laboratory for the Science of Individuality, and he also served as the director of the Mind, Brain, and Education program. Todd is the author of two best-selling books, one called The End of Average. He's given a TED Talk about that. It's pretty remarkable. It's worth checking out if you haven't already seen it. And his other book, his other best-selling book is called Dark Horse, Achieving Success Through the Pursuit of Fulfillment. This is the book that we explore in this conversation primarily. It's full of incredible stories and a ton of useful ideas to help you know yourself better, to live a more fulfilling life, and to make the contribution that's possible for you. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Todd Rose. Todd, welcome to the School for Good Living. And thanks for having me. Todd, will you tell me, please, what is life about? I think life is actually about the pursuit of happiness, like Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration. And, and by that, I mean trying to know who you are, discovering who you are, uh, pursuing a fulfilling life, things that are meaningful to you, and then turning that fulfillment into a contribution that adds value to other people's lives. Thank you. Who are you and what is your work? I, um, I'm an endlessly curious person who I absolutely hate being defined by a job title um, or anything. I just, I am obsessed about one problem, one issue, which is how do you create a society where we are all better off because each one of us is better off? Um, by that, I mean, I believe the world is zero, is positive sum, not zero sum, that nobody has to lose for me to win. And that we can create abundance both materially and psychologically when we invest in each other rather than see each other as strict competition. Mm. You know, someone once pointed out to me that in uh, Darwin's book, uh, The Origin of Species, that although we tend to think of this survival of the fittest and this competition thing, that someone pointed out to me that cooperation actually appears like a hundred times more or something like that. What is that true? It's it's exactly right. And it's even, this is what I'm, I, I find just maddening is people took Darwin and converted it into social Darwinism to fit their particular view that not everyone could thrive. And they really wanted to preserve their, their high order status and, and justify inequality. And in that same vein, um, you know, Adam Smith's well, uh, wealth of nations, right, which gave rise to free markets. People think of him as some doggy dog ultra competition. But in fact, he actually wrote the theory of moral sentiment first. He was obsessed about poor people and how we actually created an abundance so everybody could benefit. So I, I think we've misunderstood some of the best thinkers throughout history this way. Mm. Now, I realize that um, an answer to the next question I'm about to ask can largely be found in your writing already. Having written Dark Horse, Achieving Success Through the Pursuit of Fulfillment, The End of Average, How We Succeed in a World that Values Sameness, and even the book that tells your own story, Square Peg, uh, my story and what it means for raising innovators, visionaries, and out-of-the-box thinkers. But I'm going to ask the question nevertheless, because I know maybe people listening haven't read you know, all of those papers yet. But when you talk about that you're obsessed with this, about this question of like how can we 
you know, have this society where we all thrive and we all, you know, find success and fulfillment. How do we do that? What have you found? What are the answers to that question? So I think um, at, at bottom, this idea of human distinctiveness, right? That we are unique and that's not a bumper sticker. And it doesn't mean selfishness, right? That, that human beings all have, we each have something unique to offer. And once we realize that and we focus on cultivating that in each of us, that's how we get to a place that's truly positive sum, a place where we're all better off because we're each better off. But if you think about the last hundred years of industrialization, we've bet the farm on standardization, right? Like quite the opposite, assuming distinctiveness doesn't matter um, and trying to make everybody the exact same, right? Whether that's an education, the workplace, or even the ways we think about a successful life. And I believe it's robbed us individually and collectively about what makes us special as a species. Yeah, that I love that distinction in Dark Horse where you lay this out about the age of standardization versus the age of personalization. And and I know on first blush that someone might uh, might want to dismiss this whole personalization thing is, oh, this is like such a millennial mindset, <laughs> you know, such a snowflake, just fit in. I love for this book, you, you say in the book that you interviewed opera singers, dog trainers, hairstylists, florist diplomats, sommeliers. Uh, carpenters, puppeteers, architects, and barbers, chess grandmasters, and midwives, like in other words, real people, right? And even with this, I know, again, like a skeptic or a critic could say, well, these are anecdotes. You're just you're taking anecdotes. This isn't hard science or something. And yet there's something really rich and valuable in this, in, in the stories that you found. How do you, like, I mean, what was this process like of even engaging in the creation of this book? Yeah. How did you begin and and what was what did you what did you find? So here's the here's the funny thing. <clears throat> Before doing this book, I would have been that skeptic. I would have been the one that said, Are you kidding me? Uh, this qualitative research. So you interviewed some people, right? Um, it's not hard science because all of my career up until that point was strictly quantitative. I was trained in neuroscience. Um, I'm studying the science of individuality. And even to this day, I, I have a penchant for, for numbers, right? Rather than just words. But, and, and the thing about the hard science aspect of personalization is if you look at what's changed um, in every field that the science of individuality has touched, let's just take uh, medicine. Uh, if <laughs> Forever, we thought that you could use averages to understand cancer. For example, uh, colon cancer, the third most lethal cancer in the world, was diagnosed cancer in the world. For 35 years, we thought there was one pathway. Once you realized that you were studying averages and you should be studying individuals, we actually realized there were three pathways. And now our ability to detect that early has gone up exponentially and we are saving people's lives. I promise you in medicine, if I gave you the chance to have gold standard average treatment or personalized treatment, you're taking personalized, right? Because you recognize there's something about you as a distinct human being that actually matters. All I'm saying is that same insight applies to things like pursuing the kind of life you want to live and making your best contribution. So we get back to the question of like, you know, I, I had finished end of average, which was deeply hard science, you know, <laughs> this new science of individuality. And I was so interested in the people that I'd met along the way that had these atypical paths. And so I started this dark horse project at Harvard where I was a professor for 10 years. And I thought, you know what? I don't know the slightest thing about why they're able to achieve what they achieve. Maybe it's just random and just serendipitous that they succeeded. Maybe there's something systematic there, but because I didn't really have a good hypothesis, what am I gonna put numbers to it, right? So I had a good colleague who said, you know, have you tried qualitative research? And I, I was like, are you kidding me? Come on. And and they convinced me, you know, give it a try. So it was my first qualitative research study ever. And I'll tell you what, I, I am a convert. I like, it turns out you can learn a lot from listening to people, right? Like surprise, surprise, right? So it didn't take very long through structured interviews where you, you really are. Like they started challenging the things I thought, right? And I'll, I'll tell you right now, the hypothesis I had going in was that probably people who would be dark horses, which were people who sort of bucked the status quo, 
like they probably had some kind of personality characteristic, like a Richard Branson, who who I happen to know, and he is a great guy, but he absolutely gets a lot of joy purely from bucking the system, right? Like yeah. it, it, he's not embarrassed about it. He loves it. So I thought maybe you got to be that, but that is not what, what we found very quickly. Uh, I wanted to talk about stuff like, how do you get good at what you do? And what they wanted to talk about was how they discovered who they are and what they were passionate about. And, and they kept bringing up things like fulfillment and meaning and purpose. And I got to be honest, <laughs> like the first time they said fulfillment, like literally I was like, no, like, what am I supposed to do with that? Like yeah. this squishy thing of like, I care about fulfillment. And I was like, ah, but then they keep pushing on it. And so I'm like, okay, well, let's dig into that. And I thought, is that just like a, again, a bumper sticker, but no, it turned out that this was, they were prioritizing a fulfilling life over someone else's view of success. And they actually knew how to do that really well. And so out of that research came a set of insights about how you turn the pursuit of fulfillment into a very reliable path to excellence. And I actually thought at this point, you know what, this is something that deserves a wider audience than an academic paper. Um, because at the end of the day, I don't really care about publishing just for a, a, you know, a thousand academics. I want to affect real life people's lives. And so that was the origins of it. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, this whole idea of fulfillment, I find it's such an interesting one. And maybe I think this is something that we don't have a lot of, I don't know if it's vocabulary for or a shared understanding of, you know, and, and when I look even at emotion, right. And I'm reminded if you ask someone, what's the difference between a feeling and an emotion hmm. that no one really seems to have clear answers to this kind of domain in our, in our culture. Um, I mean, obviously some people devote their lives to studying this like Goldman and Ekman and so forth, but, yeah. but I think generally uh, we don't. And so it's no surprise to me that this whole thing about happiness and success, and fulfillment, these are kind of vague concepts that we maybe don't understand all that well. But I love that your book breaks this down. And it does provide basically like a formula or at least things to think about. Mm -hmm. right? And yet there's, there's this, while there's this uniqueness to all of us, there's also this commonality Right. And almost like a, what I would call what I see as a journey, right? Like the journey of the dark horse. Mm -hmm. Will you, will you talk about that? Like, what is it that, that people seem to have in common? Is there like an awakening moment, a traumatic moment, just some moment of insight that like people opt yep. out of this standardization mentality and go for this personalization mentality? What have you, what have you Yeah, seen? it was so interesting because I thought, um, just kind of given my own personal background, I thought dark horses would be people who kind of had screwed up most of their life. And then one day it was like, Hey, look, I'm not a screw up anymore. Right. Um, and you know, achieve success. So it was more like nobody saw you coming because they underestimated you. That's what I thought most dark horses would be like. And it turns out they kind of split right down the middle between that and people who were wildly successful by in some domain, right. Mm -hmm. Who wake up one day and they, they just feel empty right? They've got all the trappings of what society said success was. They're rich, they're famous, they've got a lot of power, and they just feel empty. And they say, there's got to be more. And they realize that often it was like, life's too short, I've got to do something meaningful. And they make these incredible pivots into, into spaces that you think, what are you doing, right? And then they go on to have incredible success, but they unify that kind of, they don't really care that anyone else thinks they're successful, but they are objectively good at what they do, but more importantly, that achievement is completely oriented to their own private values and priorities. Um, and for me, that's what fulfillment is. It is achieving on things that matter to you, regardless of whether they matter to anybody else. Yeah, that that's so powerful. And something that I found myself reflecting on a lot in the weeks that I spent you know, reading this book, I read it a little bit slowly to give myself a chance to digest it, was this idea of micro motives. This is such a great term. And this idea that there are universal motives. I know as employers, we want to believe that. I think as policy makers, we want to believe that, you know, it's as simple as carrots and sticks and so forth. And that's useful to a limited degree. But when it comes to living a satisfying life, I think this whole idea of micro motives is so huge. What, what is a micro motive and how can we use it to find fulfillment? Yeah, so you really nailed it, which is when we think of motivation, 
I think we all recognize that motivation is critical, but then we think about because mainly because people like me spend our career saying there must be some universal motive or at least a small set of ones that everybody's motivated by. And so we ping pong around from like, oh, everybody wants to compete or everyone wants to collaborate or whatever, right? Um, Money is a great motive. But it turns out from interviewing hundreds of these dark horses and then from actually a lot of our quantitative work at my think tank, Populous, what you find is when you really punch down into it, man, what truly motivates people is so specific and so unique to them that it's kind of silly to talk about motivation in this generic sense. So for example, talk to a guy who, no kidding, the singular thing that was the most important motive for him was being able to align things, physical things with his hands. And look, even as I say that right now, I'm like, that can't be a motive. Like, 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 to me, it doesn't, it doesn't get my heart racing. Nothing, right? It does nothing for me. And so, like, but like, this is what we found over and over again that not only did, did those exist, that 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 motivations are so much broader and specific at the same time, but that the first thing that dark horses did better than anybody else is they knew exactly what their micro motives were, and they could talk about them with you. And, and, and that became critical, right? Because if you're, if you're going to live a fulfilling life, you're, this is why the, the achievement definition is important. It's not contentment, right? It's not sitting back and saying, whatever happens to me, happens to me. It is literally achieving things. So you're going to have to get good at stuff, right? So you're going to have to learn about strat- how to be good at strategies and other kinds of stuff, make choices. But if you don't get your motivation right, if you don't align to that, you might achieve things, but you are never going to be fulfilled, right? Because the, the, the affective core of all fulfillment is motivation. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, like, I thought they had very clever ways of, of discovering them for themselves that I think are applicable for people. Yeah. And even this idea, again, it's like this term micromotive hasn't yet entered our lexicon in a broad way that people hear it and they're like, oh yeah, I understand it. And what's more is I know what mine are, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. we're like helping kids suss these out and encouraging them to follow them and things like this. But I'm looking forward to the day we are because I think it's so important. Yeah. And and, you know, it's, I've had a lot of fun um, with my own children and the, the people I know, because the thing I learned from the dark horses was that like the way you get to this, is pretty straightforward. Like if you, if you think right now about the things that bring you joy, even things you might say you're passionate about, the starting point for all understanding of micromotives is to ask yourself the question, why? So if I say I love basketball, which I do, why? Well, there, there are probably 50 reasons why people could love basketball. You know, is it just the competition? Is it is it the, the physical exertion? Is it that it's a team sport? right? These things matter. And so as you ask yourself that why, and I realized for me, I actually love the combination of the competition and the fact that you can't do it by yourself. Okay, great. Well, that's a lot different than saying I am passionate about basketball because here's the problem. If I say I'm passionate about basketball and suddenly I can't play anymore, which by the way, I can't, right? Like, Like one knee injury away from like, you know, having a pretty miserable rest of my life. Um, as my doctor just told me, you need to act your age. That's literally what he told me because it like got hurt playing basketball. So I'm acting my age now. So what would have happened? I'm stuck, right? I can't play the thing I'm passionate about. Now what? If I understand the underlying motives that made that passionate to me, those are portable, right? I can actually start to think, well, what else, you know, has that combination of good competitiveness and collaboration as a team? And I can switch that up. So I will tell you right now, the most reliable way there. And if you're a parent, or a coach, like get used to asking kids to say, hey, hey, what did you like most about school today? Why? Why? It's that why question that we don't ask them and they don't ever learn to ask themselves. But if you do that, you'll start to see the trends, right? You'll start to see patterns in things that 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 light you up. And you it won't take you, I swear, you do this for a couple of weeks and you'll be on the scent of your own micromotives in a hurry. Yeah. Well, and something else that's in there too, I think, is this about desire or in like inherent enjoyment of the thing. And I think in our society, we're trained to dishonor that, that that it's like you used the word a little earlier, 
whether it's selfish or it's indulgent or hedonistic or, you know, something, maybe it's just our puritanical heritage, you know, coming yeah. out. But sometimes it's something is strange, perhaps it might sound as strange as aligning things with your hands. Well, why, you know, talking about things, right? Like books on a shelf or dominoes or like anything that you could align with your hands. Well, if somebody finds that inherently enjoyable, That's it. then, and here's the thing. I think we, we gave up on this idea of the inherent joy that people get from things because the truth is, is in the industrial age, that wasn't really an option, right? You were trading in your distinctiveness. You were trading in fulfillment for a reliable, if not necessarily enjoyable job that could get you the white picket fence, right? And the house and the car. Look, and we can debate whether that was a good trade-off then, but, but let's just say brass tacks. The society we live in now, this technology-enabled, you know, automated society where 20 years from now, we might not even be able to ensure full employment because we don't need it. Even just how do you actually thrive as a career? Like I'm telling you, man, if you don't understand what motivates you and you don't know how to turn that into something productive, you are at an unbelievable disadvantage. And so I'm more worried than anything else. Not that this is some far off thing like, oh, okay, fulfillment. I'm saying this might be the new inequality right? That people who understand what it means to be able to truly live a fulfilling life and people who have been taught that it doesn't matter, right? So you think material inequality is a problem. What about inequality in fundamental fulfillment and happiness? I mean, that's that, and that doesn't have to happen because this is available to anyone anywhere. It doesn't require that you're wealthy. It doesn't re require that you're powerful, but it does require that you understand yourself and understand how to, how to put this into action. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of a term Tony Robbins uses sometimes about a quality problem, <laughs> right? When mm -hmm. that issue where we're dealing with equality in that level, like in that form, like that's a quality problem. Great problem to have, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but later in your book, you talk about passion and you talk about, you know, there's this, of course, this is almost cliche, even though I happen to think it's great advice that Joseph Campbell follow your bliss kind of thing. And we talk a lot about it. But you talk about not just like following your passion, but actually engineering your passion. What do you mean by that? So if we come back to these micro motives thing, right? And I think it's really important and people care about it. Um, but they often, it's funny when people talk about passion, when they first interact with it, they're like, oh, no, 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 it's important. And then when you ask them, well, is it a reliable foundation to build a life on? Oh, well, I don't know, right? It sort of feels fleeting or maybe it, whatever. When I think about engineering it, Right now, the way it works, because we don't teach people how to think about what matters to them, you find what you're passionate about almost accidentally, right? You kind of bump around in society. And then like for me, you pick up a basketball and you're like, well, this is kind of cool. Like, I really enjoy this. I'm passionate about this. Okay, great. But again, I'm stuck, right? Because it was actually in reaction to an activity that I'm like, basketball is everything to me. Well, it's not true. Basketball is the manifestation of a set of motives for you that are checking a bunch of boxes. But if you don't know what those are, you are helpless, right? You you can only get the passion and I get, I'm playing basketball, I hurt myself, what do I do, right? So when I say engineer, it's this. When people think about passion, they tend to think, well, wait, if I just knew that one motive, like the most important motive, and I find something that allows me to do that, well, then I'll be passionate. Well, look, if you're doing something that's checking one of your motives, that's fragile right? That is like, cool. Well, what happens when you're no longer motivated by that? Or what happens? Like, but what Dark Horses did consistently is you're able to understand the full range of your own micro motives. And then you engage in activities that actually check as many of those boxes as possible, right? Then that makes passion durable, sustainable, right? It, it is actually the kind of thing that becomes a good foundation for making choices and living a good life. And so when I think about engineering passion, that's what I mean. By understanding your micro motives, you can convert that into choices that consistently put you in situations where you are passionate about what you do. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. Well, something else that you talk about that I thought was really, um, I thought it was a really insightful thing was also about judgment, right? And I think you even use the term, the game of judgment, like playing, kind of playing this game with yourself to get some more insight or awareness about yourself. What do you mean by that? So, you know, I said earlier, like, ask yourself what you like to do and um, think about why that's the less judgmental version than the game of judgment. So, you know, listening to dark horses, think about how they got to their own motives. 
they played this game, which was besides what do you like to do? We spend a ton of time judging people, right? Um, it's not particularly good and we shouldn't do it. Well, what we thought was kind of cool is Dark Horses flipped it on its head and said, look, our instinct to judge people, like, you know, you walk by someone and 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 say they're they're working at a coffee shop and you're like, why? Why would someone want to work at a coffee shop? Or why would they want to pick up garbage for a living? Or why would they, whatever, you know, work in an office from nine to five? We usually use that judgment to think that is saying something about those people. That's incorrect, right? What it's telling you is it's a, it's a bright blinking light for you about who you are, right? Because the fact that I look at, if you look at somebody and you're like, wow, why would they go to an office nine to five? Okay, that is telling you something about what you would not want to do, right? You can sort of reverse engineer your motives that way. Um, and so this combination of like using judgment that your, your brain's doing automatically to turn on yourself, combined with thinking about the things that you know you love and asking yourself why, Man, I'm telling you, those two things will get you to a rock solid understanding of your own micro motives. Yeah, I I can see that. And you know, for me, um, like I've seen some of these what I think are micro motives, and I'd love to just ask you about it while we're connected this way now. You know, one of them is I've learned about myself that I love uh, sameness with variation. And mm. an example of that is like I love these podcast interviews because it's the same structure. It's these three parts about whoever my guest's life and work is. Then there's a question on a variety of topics. And then we delve into the writing and creativity. That's one example, but the book always changes and the guest changes. And, and so I don't know if this is an example of like a micro motive, but I love one-on-one -on -one conversation. I love sharing things with other people and mm -hmm. love words and language, you know, so there's like a lot in there where this has now been three years and like 150 of these conversations that I don't know all the needs it meets for me, but I know I love it. Yeah, no, this is exactly right. Because think about like, if all you thought was, man, I love podcasts, right? I am passionate about podcasts. What do you do with that besides continue to do podcasts, right? Like yeah. what happens when suddenly you can't do podcasts? And here, because you're already articulating that next level, right? Let's just, you know, let me just speculate. So the one-to-one -one conversation. So not clear to me that maybe you'd be th as thrilled if suddenly you're sitting on stage like Tony Robbins talking to a mass audience. Maybe you would, but like, that's certainly not one-to-one, -one, right? Like it's one-to-many. Um, I, I think books, like you're talking about, books are phenomenal for, for a very similar reason, right? Even though they are mass communication, when, when you were reading my book, I was in your head. It was just the two of us, Yep. right? I got a chance. The most precious thing in the world is your attention. And I got to be in your head for hours. Yeah. And I, I, I treat that as sacred, like, and, and treat that as something that I need to, to put my heart and soul into because I got your captive attention for hours. Right. So I like, I love, and by the way, I love this idea. I've never heard anyone talk about this combination of like sameness and variation, but, but think how cool it is. Like, like variation for its own sake, isn't great. Right. Even I am, I'm like a variation junkie, but uh -huh. the truth is, is I have routine too, you know, and, and what I realized about it is I want variation where it actually can surprise me, where it can benefit me. But I, I, I don't want to go out on the road and be like, oh, I wonder which side of the road I drive on today. Like, no, no, I, I, I those things I'd like to st stay the same. So think about like, if we got on here and there was an, no structure. Yeah that variation would impair our ability to connect yep. and impair our ability to get to the essence of the variation that, that makes life meaningful for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that distinction. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. And that uniformity, I mean, I was the, this, the example that you gave before about the gentleman who loved to align things with his hands. I thought that was such an, a powerful story too. And for anyone listening, one of the things that you might love about this book, if you pick it up is that, these stories, it's not just like many books where the story is told in one part of the book and it's an anec a brief anecdote, but it's woven in and out of chapters. And, and so different, you can learn multiple things from a single story. And one of the things that was powerful to me about that, if I have this story right, was that that guy used that micromotive actually to end up making a lot of money for his company because he created <laughs> telecommunications technology. Yeah. 
right? But then as he got into the corporate world and he thought, man, these guys who are making decisions, here I am like as an engineer and they're making decisions that impact me and I'm not making the money I could. So then he decides to go get his own MBA and he loses touch with his passion and his micromotive. Yeah, he ends up making money and getting advancement, but then he's not happy. And it was like, wow, that was such a powerful, you know, example of how when we drift from that thing that really lights us up, we can actually end up in a really crappy place. Yeah, isn't that crazy? And what was so amazing is that, again, for me, I can't emotionally connect to, to aligning physical objects. It, it's an intellectual exercise for me, but that's the point of micromotives, yeah. right? That's why they're easy for us to think, no, everyone's motivated by the same things, the things that I'm motivated by, right? Like that's, that's I think, where we arrive. But but Saul was his name. It, it's like, it was such a cautionary tale that actually has a good ending. But it's like, yeah, he, he ended up with it. Uh, you think, well, what does someone do with, with that kind of motive? It's like, yeah, that's, we just a failure of imagination because he actually literally made his company a ton of money by inventing this thing in telecommunications that I think everybody largely agreed he was uniquely situated to have discovered. But like you said, he saw that middle managers were getting more money as a result and rightly, I thought he felt like, hold on, I'm the one that made this invention. And like, okay, but he thinks, well, then I just got to be a manager. Well, if you know him at all, and he is a phenomenal person, he's, he, his motives are not aligned to being a manager, right? He doesn't actually like people. Like he doesn't, he doesn't, he, he's like, it, and it's cool, it's okay, right? But, um, but so he gets into that space where now all of a sudden the motives that would actually enable him to be good and, and, and draw fulfillment from it are not there and he's miserable. And the truth is he's not good at it anymore, right? Because the, the thing is, is like, when do you ever half-ass anything you care about? You don't, right. right? You just don't. So now suddenly you're doing it for a reason that you think you should, but it, it's not aligned to anything you, that matters to you. You're not going to be good at it. And so he ends up out of the business and it passes him by. And then, you know, he ends up, doing some really incredible work that had nothing to do with this once he gets back in line with his own motives. Um, and he ended up being, and still is one of the top upholstery pair people in New York. And what's funny is when he first told me that I was like upholstery pair, but then when he dug into it, first of all, you hear him light up when you talk about your, yeah, you're doing the right thing, buddy. This is what you should be doing. But I didn't quite appreciate that. Like upholstery pair, what he does is like, leather work and family heirlooms and it is fundamentally about aligning things right and he got his own little business so he doesn't have to be around a lot of people and he 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 gets on his bike and he goes places and he just loves it he just loves it and i promise you if we were doing career day for saul nobody was going to compare being an engineer and being an upholstery repair person right because only in a world of understanding micromotives are those two things actually on the same level but there we are, right? He's able to make that choice for himself. Yeah. Well, and and this is exactly the thing too, right? About choice. And you talk about this. I think it's kind of the element number two is to know your choices. And I think, again, this is an area that we maybe you use the term failure of imagination, or maybe we feel an obligation or we think we should do something or not do something. But what, how, do, how does choice then fit into all this? Because there is that dictum, right? Know thyself. Yep. <laughs> That's a huge place to start. And then when it comes to choice, how do you end up, how do you think about choice? Yeah, so I love the know thyself. Just to come back to that, because we often think know thyself means know what you're good at. Ability is completely contextualized. That is not a solid foundation to know who you are. Motives are far more indelible, right? It doesn't mean they can't change but they're much more about who you really are and they're a reliable foundation for self-knowledge. Choice was interesting because that seems kind of almost like a throwaway. They were obsessed about choices, right? And they didn't waste them. Um, I think in a, in a standardized society where actually, if you think about it, outside of commerce, we don't actually, our systems don't really give us a lot of meaningful choice, really. Like it's education doesn't, work doesn't, you know, it's like, we, again, we go, we go to the supermarket, we do. <laughs> Places that matter most, we don't. So as a result, I think we tend to hoard those choices and we, we hedge. We don't want to, well, what if I, if I choose door A, well, what, maybe I'll miss out on some, door B. Man, these, these dark horses, they were obsessed about understanding their choices and even creating choices where once didn't exist. And then they make the choice, right? And 
I'll, I'll tell you one thing, if you don't mind, about the thing that, that I internalized the most from them about making choices that really, really was pretty profound because I kept hearing them and I think, right, but like, you know, when I was, when I was young, married, high school dropout, on welfare, two kids, what, like, cool, make choices that are <laughs> optimized fulfillment. Are you kidding me? Like, but here's what they did that I think is so important. And, 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 and for listeners, the way, like, it doesn't matter where you're starting from, you always have some choice, always. There is no way that you, that you don't have some kind of option. And what Dark Horses did is it's a kind of a two-step thing that is critical. Out of those options, they are almost never equal in terms of their p- potential to align to your motives, right? But, but they would ask a second question, and this is critical. Can you live with the worst case scenario, right? So if like one of the, one of the Dark Horses literally packed up everything he had, left the States and went and lived in a cottage in England to learn horticulture and some other skills that he needed, right? Well, wait, I, I couldn't have done that. I, I can't when I, like leave my kids behind or like, like, no, I can't, I can't not have a job, right? So, so what they would say is if you can't live with the worst outcome, then go on to the next most fulfilling thing. And what you're trying to find is that combination where it is the most potentially fulfilling it can be. And if it fails spectacularly, you can live with that outcome. That lesson for me has been profound. It's affected literally everything, including, no kidding, I chose to leave Harvard as a professor because I realized that my path to a fulfilling life and the things that I wanted to do no longer involved academia. There's no way that I would have thought to make that choice or dared to make that choice, I think, without learning that lesson from dark courses. Wow. What, was there a catalyzing event? I mean, what was the moment? Or what was that insight like? So <laughs> I don't believe I loved I mean I loved the people I worked with and and Harvard's a great place. I don't believe in the institution of higher education as it's structured. I don't believe in the false scarcity model of quality. I don't believe in the well I was gonna use a word I shouldn't use probably on a podcast. Um we literally force people to compete for artificially scarce scarce resources, right? And we get a stranglehold on opportunity. Because I went to Harvard the things I can do all around the world, it, it's ridiculous, right? And Harvard hasn't added a single seat to their undergrads in like 60 years. They have $40 billion on endowment. Now listen, again, wonderful people. So I had convinced myself, well, I'm gonna change society. I wanna change society. I, 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 that's obviously contrary to an entire positive sum worldview. And I thought, well, you know what? I'll use the leverages. I love the people there and this, show up anywhere and say you're a Harvard professor and no one questions that you know what you're talking about. They should, but they don't. Um, and I convinced myself that that wasn't being a hypocrite, right? But who, who was I kidding, right? What I, what I really liked was that my identity was bound up in that. And as someone who had been a spectacular failure in school for most of my life, I realized I had taken too much um, pride in the affiliation. And so I had convinced myself you know, look, uh, I need this. And when I thought it through, I thought, okay, what I really want to do is start my own think tank, start my own companies that allow me to get closer to the public than just to academia. So you think through, well, what happens if I leave Harvard? What happens if I give up the potential for tenure somewhere, right? A a guaranteed job. And I realized, wait a minute, as long as I have some savings, you know, my kids are older now. My wife said, well, We've been poor before, right? Really, what? We've already been poor. So worst case scenario, we realized we we would have to give up everything we have in Boston. And we may end up back in Utah, which beautiful place, living with my parents. Is that really the end of the world? No, it, it's not my preference, but it is not the end of the world. So I made the jump and it's been unbelievable. Like it, it is the best decision I ever made. And I am far more fulfilled than I would, never would have taking that jump without dark horses. Wow. That's great. Um, it's always wonderful when it works out. <laughs> <As well. laughs> right. <laughs> Even than you had, you had planned or hoped, but as you talk about this think tank, so this is populist, mm-hmm. right? We, what, what is it? How does it work? What does it do? It, I, okay. This is where I get excited. So I told you at the beginning, 
um, I believe society can be positive some, and that's just not in terms of material abundance, like free markets, but psychological abundance, like flourishing and happiness and fulfillment. And I believe we have a good sense for what the institutional and cultural conditions need to be. And uh, we started a think tank that is really more about action um, to drive those things, a culture of high, high trust and institutions that are aligned with and stay aligned with the public's values and preferences. So we engage in that. Um, and one of my favorite things, uh, probably the thing we're most known for right now is innovative private opinion research, because all of that depends on knowing what the American public truly thinks and really wants. And I'll just tell you one example, because it's related to the dark horse stuff. We did the largest private opinion study ever on people's views of a successful life. It was inspired by dark horse for sure, right? But I was kind of wondering like, what if there's something weird about dark horses, right? They're just like this anomaly and the rest of us don't really think like that. And so their insights may not be all that applicable. I didn't think it was true, but I, you know, <laughs> better to figure that out. Um, and so the private opinion methods we use get around what just what you're willing to say out loud um, and get at what you really believe. And and they these methods are, are used all over the place, but here's what we found. And this is what was so exciting to me. With, with the the American Success Index these, this, that we did with Gallup, it was unreal. Like the, out of 76 different trade-off priorities people could have, the overwhelming majority of Americans across all demographics, age, wealth, like you name it, race, gender, they want fulfillment. And what they absolutely don't want and absolutely don't care about is this garbage idea of a zero-sum comparative race to wealth, status, and power. I'm going to give you one concrete example of this. And oh, let me just back up and say, the most interesting insight in that whole thing is what I call a collective illusion. We privately, almost all of us want this pursuit of meaning and purpose and fulfillment, but we are absolutely convinced that most other people don't. We think that most everybody else in our society still wants wealth, status, and power. And here's the finer point on that. Out of 76 different trade-off priorities, again, using methods that you can't game, being famous was viewed as the most important thing to most Americans. That's what we thought. If, if I ask you, what do you think most Americans care about? It's being famous is number one by a landslide, right? Turns out it is actually dead last in private. Dead last. So what people care about, character, relationships, education to be able to pursue things they care about. Like it is so remarkable and I'm happy to share it. it it's on our website. It's, it's, it will make you, you will love what's true about us as a people. And then you'll be kind of taken aback by how wrong we are about each other. And I believe those illusions are, are ripping our society apart. And so you just got to understand, like most people are actually more like these dark horses than we realized and, and made decisions and went for it when the rest of us kind of held back and said, ah, I don't know, right? And so I hope the book actually enables more people to get on a path of fulfillment rather than continuing to chase society's view of a success. That's really interesting. Does that hold true even for younger people? Because some of what I've read and even my personal experience talking to my kids and some of their friends in that is that it seems like they all wanna be famous YouTubers and streamers and things like that. You You've nailed this. Okay, so here, here's the problem. And by the way, this is literally the title of my next book. That I'm I'm just finishing. I have to get submitted to the publisher on Monday evening. So oh. <laughs> if it doesn't, if I don't get it done in time, I'm blaming you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, here's the thing about collective illusions. The fame example. So dead last in private, but we believe it's number one. Okay. So when we go to our Hollywood partners and our advertising partners and say, wait, why do you keep telling us? Why do you keep signaling fame? And they say, we're just giving people what they want. They can't read our minds. They, they're they falling for the same illusion, right? So so, so let me tell you, the, the problem with collective illusions is unless you dismantle them, they tend to become the private opinion of the next generation. So mm -hmm. specifically, UCLA has studied uh, middle school kids, 12 year olds, as they kind of become, right? How they start to see themselves for about 20 years. I, I'll get the, the exact number off there, like 18 years or something. But up until about four years ago, 
every year, the dominant theme of, the, of kids of what they were thinking about had to do with character. I want to be a good person. I want to be a good friend. I want to have friends, right? About four years ago, it actually changed. To, I want to be famous. I want to be a YouTube star. And that's been the dominant thing for the last four years. So think about what we're doing here. Because we're all quietly trying to pursue fulfilling lives, we realize that society's definition is hollow and it, it does not end well for any of us. <clears throat> but because we think everybody cares about these other things, we don't say anything. In fact, most dark horses were almost ashamed. They, they, they were like, oh, I don't know that anyone else should follow me. I, I don't know. I'm a little weird, right? I'm quirky. I guess this other thing is probably good for everybody else. So we don't say anything. And we keep operating under this illusion. And, and the people that are going to pay the biggest price for that are our children. Uh, but it's not too late, right? We need, to, we need to realize that things, our values matter. They are not collateral damage to some industrial society just because <laughs> like they matter. And if we're not willing to stand up and say what those things are and be willing to put them into action in our lives, then not only is, are our lives diminished, so are everybody else's. So are our children. And one last thing I'll tell you, just to put a finer point on this. In that study, we actually looked at life satisfaction, right? Gallup has a very, very clever question about a ladder, 10-point scale ladder. They've used all over the world. Like, where would you put your life, right? 10 being like, well, I'm living my best life to like, one, I'm really struggling. You know, turns out that people who were achieving on their own values, according to our success index, right? Your own trade-off priorities, which by the way, were as individual as anything, unbelievable, like ridiculously individual. A 20-point boost in that was the equivalent in terms of a boost in life satisfaction to you getting a 50% pay raise. Wow. But if you were, if you were achieving on society's definition, zero, no increase in life satisfaction. There is nothing to be had for you achieving on someone else's view of a good life. And there is everything to be had for you knowing who you are and what matters to you and achieving on that. That's really beautiful. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a great thing to know. My suspicion is that we don't really learn that until we experience it for ourselves <laughs> though. Yeah. And usually the hard way, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, and I think like, great. I like, I'm someone who usually has to learn everything the hard way. So that's fine. But I think like, there's no reason why this has to be accidental, serendipitous discovery, right? We can cultivate it. We can teach people how to know who they are. Because by the way, nobody can do it for you. We can pretend to give you some garbage standardized test of personality, be like, you're a type A person. It's not how it works. Not how it works, yeah. right? You are a human being. You're multidimensional. Context matters. Only you know. So let's trust people. Let's empower people with the knowledge and skills they need to know themselves, to make choices for themselves and to pursue the kind of life that they care about and make their best contribution. Mm. How does this fit with what you say in the book about know your strategies? That was pretty cool. So we often, okay. So we often think when we think about being excellent at, at something, it's like, Think about even in school or other places, there's like one right way to do something. And that's not accidental, by the way. The father of standardization, Frederick Taylor, who literally gave us things like managers and often and, and factories, right? Literally, his, his biography is called One Right Way. He thought there was one right way to do everything, figure it out, standardize the system, and make everybody do it that way, right? Well, it turns out that's absolutely wrong. It is mathematically wrong. Like, there's actually um, complex systems, which is part of my background. There's a, a thing called equifinality, which is like one of the only laws of complex systems, which is for any outcome you care about, there is always more than one equally valid way to get there. So what Dark Horses did, which is just unbelievably cool, is as they're pursuing, okay, so let's say I know my motives, I've made some choices. Okay, well, now I've chosen into something, but achievement isn't just choice. Achievement is accomplishment. So how do I get good at this thing? And what was so cool is it's it's not just like continuing to do the same thing over and over again and hoping you get different results, right? That was like Einstein's insanity, right? No. It was that they, they recognized that it was about figuring out out of the range of ways something could be done, 
some strategies will fit with your own individuality better than others. And it was about cycling through strategies until you found the one that clicked and then you take off. And it was pretty cool because like when you, when you looked at how they were progressing in their life, they would hit these points where it looked like they were stuck, right? Where people say like, you haven't made progress. And in their mind, they're like, no, yeah, no, I'm just going through the strategy. So I find one that works <laughs> and then they take off. And by the way, this one was kind of personal to me because I didn't realize that this, for me, this happened. So, you know, like I t- told you, like I high school dropout at a 0.9 GPA, <laughs> which is about as bad as you could get. Um, and I am working my way. I, I was working a string of minimum wage jobs on welfare, two kids. I was like, something has to change. I ended up going to college at night, got my GED, went to college at night at Weber State University. By applying some of these things, I didn't realize what I was doing. I was just desperate to, <laughs> to do something better. I was trying to find good fit for myself. Long story short, I end up getting ready to graduate 3.97 GPA, honor student of the year there. And my mentors had convinced me that I could go to graduate school. I didn't know anyone that had gone to graduate school. But what I was facing was the GRE, which I am terrible at standardized tests, to this day, terrible at standardized tests. And I was stuck on a particular one. They don't do this section anymore, thank goodness. But it was the analytical reasoning. And it was those kind, remember those questions that are like, okay. Farmer John has four rows and he has corn, peas, carrots, and whatever, you know, tomatoes. And tomatoes can't be next to corn and blah, blah. And then they go like, what's in row two, column three? And I'm like, what? Like, yeah. I don't know, right? Um, and so I'm, I've been, pra- I had taken a practice course, at the University of Utah on Saturdays. I've been trying. I'd done well on the verbal quantitative reasoning. I had yet after 10 weeks, had not got higher than the 13th percentile on analytical reasoning. And I am panicked, right? I'm like, well, so not graduate school, right? <laughs> like, um, and I'm, I can't get this problem right. And I'm literally sitting at my parents' house because we lived in a 400 square foot apartment. <laughs> so whenever I need to study, I had to go to their house. And I was so mad. And this is, I don't recommend this, this approach. I threw a pencil across the room just out of frustration. My dad happened to walk in Right. As the pencil like flew past him, and yeah, he didn't take kindly to that, nor should he. Like, what's what's wrong with you? And I was telling how frustrated I was, and he walked over, and he thank goodness he looks down, and he's an engineer by training, and he said, "Oh, that's a degrees of freedom degrees of freedom problem," and I didn't know what that meant. And he said, "How you doing it?" And I start telling him, he's like, "Wait, you're trying to do it in your head," and he knew more about me than I knew about myself at that point. He said. You know, you have terrible working memory, which is true. Like holding stuff in my mind, forget it. Like, like that's never going to happen. And he said, listen, try doing it this way. Diagram, and he draws this diagram. He said, I think that'll work for you. And I was like, that can't be true. But I tried it on one problem and it was really simple. Tried it on another, it was really simple. Still didn't trust him because um, I, I take it back to my professor. I said, hey, look, my dad showed me this other strategy. What's wrong with it? And he goes, I mean, nothing. I, I just do it in my head, but you can do whatever you want. So a week and a half later, I literally only missed one problem on the entire analytical reasoning subsection of the GRE. It was my highest score. Wow. And, and I tell you that because I think it's funny. Like you could say, well, man, Todd is really analytical. I don't think that's a takeaway. <laughs> like, I think strategy is critical and fit between your individuality and the strategy is everything. And if you get that right, you will be amazed at what you can accomplish. And for those of you that have been struggling through something that you care about, but if you don't care about, that's your first problem, right? If you care and you're struggling, I guarantee you it is not because you can't accomplish it, it's because you don't have the right strategy. Start looking wide, start trying different things and realize it is not a waste of time to cycle through different strategies. You will find one that fits and you will be off and running. That's a beautiful message. Yeah. And, and one, I forget the, you know, I'm sure many people have offered advice this way, right? But it's about when you have something you want and that first approach doesn't work, that it's don't change the outcome. Don't change the goal that you're striving for. Change your approach. Right. You know? And, and, and it's just, and I promise you, like, this was what Dark Horses nailed this. It is amazing. Um, so, uh, like, whatever you do as a listener, like, if you care about it, do not give up. Like, that that barrier is usually has to do with the, the wrong strategy. And we just sort of adopt like what we see someone else do and think, well, they they did it. So that must be the right way. Not how it works.
yeah, there is a lot of, there is a lot of freedom in that uh, and, and giving yourself permission to, to try another path, you know? So, okay. Um, we've covered a lot and I've, I've really enjoyed this. What, what haven't we talked about related to dark horse or, um, this whole thing about individuality I know that's central, so central to your work, but before we transition to the next part of our conversation, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you, you want to, or you think would be of, of benefit to the listener? Yeah. So the hardest part of dark horse, sort of pursuing a dark horse mindset is the last thing that is, is this, and I called it ignore your destination. And this seems so risky, but it is so important. We are taught in a standardized system because we have so few choices. You better figure out what you're going to be when you grow up and you better know that and you better just pursue it doggedly. That is such a bad idea. You are your own North star, right? You always have choices, know who you are and make choices off of that. Right. And focus on that because you might think there's only one thing you could ever be in life that would be fulfilling. It's just not true. There are so many things that you could do, right? What you can't afford is to get distracted from the focus on who you are and what matters most to you, because you'll start chasing other people's views of what you should be and how you should be it. But as long as you focus on your set on internally, right? And I don't mean that selfishly. I don't mean like ignore other people. I just mean no, there is no substitute for knowing who you are and achieving on those values. Mm. Oh, thanks for sharing that. You know, to me, as I read that about ignore your destination, it, it occurred for me as right in line with what I think some of the greatest spiritual teachers have taught about renouncing the fruits of your labor or taking no thought for the things of the morrow, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, I think there's even a nuance there though, Right, because it's one thing to pursue a, an outcome or to strive for a destination because that's what society thinks or someone who's important to you thinks. But then there's also our own self-imposed destinations, right? But my sense was in listening to what you're saying now and in what you wrote that it's really ignoring both in some ways. Which, again, this is almost for me the realm of the metaphysical, right? Yeah. Like set a destination, but you'll never reach the horizon. And you don't want to, you don't want to like, that was the coolest thing about dark horses is there is no destination. I mean, like one of my favorite ones of all was a woman who literally like any part of her life would have been a, a hero's journey, you know, from a, a abusive relationship to getting herself to become literally manifesting and becoming a, a, a sound engineer on Prince's purple rain album. Like th that journey from from a, a terrible relationship with no education to this itself could have been a lifetime, right? And we, I would have still told her story, named Susan Rogers, and said, "There you go, right?" She gets there and realizes, "Amazing, what's next?" And she realized she loved the the brain, and she wanted to said she, at, in her forties, decided to go and be a professor, and that's what she does today. So. When you get hung up on a destination, like it fundamentally, number one, it will lead you to make bad choices in the here and now, or which will minimize fulfillment, not maximize it. Worse, it literally lowers your horizons. It takes away this vast expanse of what's possible and fixates on a very narrow idea of the life you wanna live. Be open to surprise, be open to new opportunities. Because even if you knew what the destination was, like the society around you can change the opportunity landscape can change so focus on here and now focus on who you are and be good at making choices that you have in front of you that's not a that's not about not setting goals it's just not setting silly ones that are so contingent on a dozen different outcomes that you couldn't control if you wanted to yeah susan's story is so remarkable it's amazing in that whole thing so Again, I know this is one of those probably you got to read the book, but <laughs> right. isn't that great? Isn't that great? Oh yeah. I, I, I'm, I guess am I supposed to say, you know, as I say in the book, right? Isn't that the line I'm supposed to say? <laughs> yeah. But that story about her going to that concert at the forum and just Chilling. saying, I one day will be that like this, what did she say? I don't know if it was a sound engineer, but one day I will be here. I will be in this building and I will be performing the function of a sound technician or a sound engineer. And, 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 
it, she can't sing for anything. She can't do things. And it's like, and I love her journey. I mean, I love where it's like, there's a place in LA where these kind of people get trained. Well, she doesn't have the money to get in. So what does she do? You always have a choice. She became a secretary there on a condition that she could drop in on some classes. And then she wanted the technical skills that you couldn't just drop in on. Well, what does she do? You can say, well, guess what? I don't have opportunity. Nah, she figures out that the US Army has the most definitive manual on this kind of stuff. So she calls them up and says, listen, could you send me that manual? And they said, well, are you um, interested in maybe enlisting? And she said, well, I'm not not interested. <laughs> it's like, because she's like, I don't want to lie to you, but I'm like, I'm not not interested. But I, uh, and I said, you know what? Sure. A couple of weeks later, these massive manuals arrive to her and she, she teaches herself. So I'm saying like, listen, there's always, a, you always have a choice. There's always a way, right? And sure enough, like she has this amazing moment with Prince, right? Because by the way, Prince decides he's going to hole up in Minnesota and build, build a sound studio in his house. And, and all the action was in LA. Nobody wants to go to Minnesota. No offense. I mean, I, I, I think it's a beautiful place, but like, so there she has an opportunity and there she goes, right? It just, I just love it. And, and it's so funny because it's easy to look at those stories and go, well, that's just an anomaly, right? That's an anomaly. Well, I'm telling you, listen, I think I've studied more anomalies than anybody else in this country. And they're not as anomalous as you think they are, right? We've been sold a bill of goods. We've, we've been told that there's one way to live your life and it's all the same. And, oh, it just so happens to be very, very good for other people, <laughs> not the contributing part, but we'll pit it ourselves against each other all in the pursuit of the same stupid thing that doesn't make any of us happy. So uh, Susan's probably my absolute favorite story in the book. Yeah, it's amazing. And there's so many takeaways from it too. Even like that, you mentioned, you know, that abusive relationship and the decision to leave and the, the moment of that. Or when she met Prince, right? And and here she is working on his estate or in his home or whatever. And he comes down the first time they meet and barely even acknowledges her, but she asserts herself. And it's like, hi, I'm Susan. I'm here to be your, you know, I'm, I'm here to serve you this way. But she knows they're in some real way, they're equals. You and know? Exactly. And, she, and, and the thing is exactly right, right? She has her dignity and she is going to assert herself. And then for them to end up back in the LA Forum, together sharing that moment that was this pinnacle for each of them at that time in their life. I'm going to tell you one, one thing that I haven't told anybody. Uh, my publisher won't be terribly thrilled. So normally I like to be a good collaborator, um, but I won't name who it was because it wasn't my editor who was amazing. Actually, it was their legal department. I don't care. It was their <laughs> legal department. Said right towards the end before we're going to publish the book, said you need to take out the fact that she was in an abusive relationship. What if the what if the husband, which I didn't name, what if the husband sues <laughs> for so I had to sign a deal, a waiver for them, an indemnity clause that like if he sued, it would be me that he sues. And I was like, selfishly, I was like, first of all, that'd be amazing. I would love to be the person being sued because some jerk who beat his wife now doesn't want to be like embarrassed. <laughs> like so, anyway, so here's how I got out and I'm as you can see, I'm only telling stories where I'm the hero. So this is good. But, um, <laughs> but so I said, okay, I hear you. They're like, well, we're not, you got to take it out. I said, okay, well, let me tell you how this is going to go. Um, I was going to be on CBS this morning, 12 million viewers. I said, let me tell you the, the first story I'm going to tell them is about the story you made me take out. And they're like, you wouldn't do that. I said, watch me. And I said, when I'm on Fox news, the first story I'm going to tell them is the story that you're making me take out. So it was pretty funny. So they finally like, okay, if you basically wave up, we are not responsible for this, you know, so lo and behold, you know, nothing ever happened, but. Wow. Yeah. That, that, I, I feel like you would have been doing Susan and, and the reader a disservice to not. Yeah. not. It start, starts with her working with Prince and ends with her a professor. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and one of the other takeaways from that as well. And I think what you've shared about your decision to leave Harvard mirrors this, right. Is even when we do pick a destination and we, we arrive there, that it's often not, although it might be as wonderful as we thought it would be, it's often not. But even if it is, there comes a point where, you know, we're ready for something new and life really is a process. And, and just to be aware of that phenomenon and not living for this someday, I'll, I'll, I'll really be happy. Because exactly, because here's the thing. I'm not saying that you can't arrive at a destination and have it be fulfilling for the rest of your life. That's certainly possible. 
But there's literally no downside to ignoring the destination. Because as long as you're focused on who you are and your own motives and, and, and aligning your choices to them, if the situation you're in is the fulfilling thing, you'll still be there. What this approach does is keep you open to the idea that there are other possibilities, right? Other horizons, other, other mountains to climb. So I, I, I see it as like, literally, there's no downside to this approach to thinking about it. Well, and I know I was asking you, you know, your final final things to share, but I just want to also kind of circle back to one other thing that you, you made a point in the book that for me was a shift in my thinking about strengths, right? That we often think we've got to know our strengths and leverage those and all this, but every strength, as you point out, every strength is, has a weakness or has a liability associated. And if we focus on a strength over a micro motive or even a strategy, sometimes that ultimately we don't achieve the fulfillment that's possible for us. About yeah. That, well, and thank you. And, and to me, that's where strength and strategy to me just go together. It's listen, it's just where there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, if I want, if I want to accomplish something, here's the funny, I'm going to tell you this example and I'm going to butcher the name because you go, I, I just call them wine experts. Cause every time I say our Psalms, right. Sommelier and then people who know go, that's not how it's pronounced. So anyway, <laughs> Sommelier, Sommelier, I don't know. I can't, I can't get my French accent, but like these wine experts. So those people that don't know, and, and we studied like a lot of them, a couple dozen, there is this, these master level, highest level psalms it is the hardest test in the world there are actually more people who have been to outer space than have passed that test and it is a single test right either you pass it or you don't it is so hard out of a couple of dozen people that we interviewed who had all reached that pinnacle there weren't two people that used the same strategy bonkersly different strategies like that were aligned and they only ever get over the hump when they figure out the one that aligns to their what if, like what because I would have thought you just like cram and memorize like ones in no, like so it just crazy ones. Some some people had a um, tactile strengths that tied to a strategy that allowed them to actually do it. It's just crazy. So the point is focus on who you really are in terms of what motivates you. Uh, you need to be aware of your strengths and limitations, but only to the extent that it allows you to pick the right kind of strategies. Awesome. All right. Um, well, with your permission, let's go ahead and transition to the enlightening lightning round. All right. I hope I don't fail. Here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How are you doing, by the way? You doing all right? I'm doing well. Good, good, good. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a carnival. <laughs> okay. Number two, what important truth do you believe that very few people agree with you on? I believe that people are fundamentally trustworthy um, and that because we fail to recognize that, um, we don't invest in them. So specifically, I think if you did something like guaranteed income, not even tied to having a job, that people would actually work harder. They would contribute more, but we're so afraid that if we actually truly support people, that they will just not work hard, that they won't do things. And it's just wrong. It's wrong. And that right now is holding us back. Hmm. Okay. There's at least one book in that too, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're on to my shtick. This is yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? It's funny. My, my actual answer is uh, stop reading slogans on a shirt. Um, but uh, like, I, I, I like, I actually actively dislike <laughs> any kind of logo. Um, actually, like, yeah, I would say be you. And that's a, that's a, such seems like such a throwaway line, but like, like your distinctiveness is not selfishness. It doesn't have to be, it, it's everything. It's everything for you and it's everything to what you can contribute to humanity. So be you. Awesome. Okay. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? I 
I actually have a few. So sorry, I'm cheating here. I love books. Um, I think listen, listen, people who listen to this also love books. So it's all good. Karl uh, Popper's, this is, this is the one that I'm a reformed academic. So Karl Popper's, the logic of scientific discovery will ch- completely blow your mind about what science really is. I thought it was about collection of facts and, and proving oh, it is so much more anti-authority and so much cooler than that fundamentally changed how I thought of myself as a scientist. I think it's worth everybody reading. Um, I, w- I would make it required reading in high school science class. Um, I believe that um, anything by Seneca, uh, the Stoic, because uh, Stoicism, we tend to think of as almost like removing yourself from the world, but that wasn't Seneca. Seneca was this bundle of contradictions, which is why I love him. He, he he was trying to help people figure out how to live a good life, um, taking responsibility for their own emotions. Um, but unlike other Stoics, he actually was like, he was the, one of the richest people in Rome. You know, so it, like, it's like, they called him a hypocrite, but I was like, no, he, he can tell you that money doesn't matter. It's easy to say it doesn't matter when you have none, right? Like, and so yeah. I love the fact that he was obsessed with um, helping people come to terms with what ha- real happiness was, how much power they really had. And he wrote in Latin instead of Greek to make it accessible to everyday people. Um, and he was obsessed about the practicality of the ideas. Um, the, um, the, this is going to be a, a, a silly one. Um, there, there are a little, um, it's a three book series, like a little pamphlets actually called riveting reports. <laughs> here's here's why uh when i never imagined i would be an author because i hated writing because i tried to do it the way everybody else did which is just write a draft i I can't do that i will get i'll spin my wheels on a paragraph and it was like it was torture river reports is stunning sentences and powerful paragraphs is the the three-part thing they're simple changed my life in terms of what it means to write the opening uh line in that little manual was you cannot think and write at the same time. And I was like, whoa, that's exactly what I was doing. And it shows you a way to start from the opposite side, which for me with a bad for working memory was perfect rather than just jumping in. Transform my life. I literally recommended it every every class I ever taught at Harvard. And without fail, there were always a half dozen students who thought it was transformative. So if you feel like there you have something to say and you're like, but but I just can't write like that. I think this is an unbelievably amazing thing. And it's like 10 bucks. So that's awesome. That's uh, you know, confirmation for me. There's no, there's no true correlation between price and value. Exactly. That's awesome. What are you currently reading? Ah, uh, man, I, I, I've been reading like crazy. I, I read this um, really kind of crazy, cool book um, called, I believe it was called just recently uh, in like, is it, into the Magic House journey into the Magic House by um, this uh, brain surgeon who's also part of the contemplative tradition, not fully Buddhist, but works with the Dalai Lama. Um, found it unbelievable. Like oh, as someone who deeply appreciates the contemplative tradition, had the honor of um, getting um, stuck in a uh, lunch just with four people, including the Dalai Lama in DC. Someone, someone actually um, called in a bomb threat. And so we were stuck just a small number of us around a table for over four hours. Wow. And I got to just ask him all these questions. It just blow your mind. Right. Um, wow. and so, but this book was just pretty cool. It actually pushed my thinking about things like manifesting, which I thought was a little like, eh. I was like, actually it's pretty cool. And it's just, I just, I loved it. So it's, yeah, interesting. Um, I just Googled into the magic shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart by James Stody. <laughs> And what I like is that even the title doesn't sound like something I would want to read. <laughs> it was actually gifted to me by someone who I really admire. And I actually literally only read it because she sent it to me. And wow. I was like, ah, come on. And then I started reading it. I said, you know what? I'm going to sit down and start reading it just because I got to be able to tell her that I, I, I read it. Right. I tried. I was captured. I, I read it in one sitting. I cried three times. Oh, my goodness. That is a high recommendation. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. We'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes here. Okay. Uh, question number five. This one's about travel, you know, back in the good old days, the days that are coming. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, you've traveled a lot. What's something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? <clears throat> so this probably gets back to um, something you said earlier about the, you know, the, the, the sameness and the variation. So what I found is that I love it. I love traveling. I, 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 you know, I've been to places that I, I would go to every country in the world if I could. Um, and just in the last couple of years, I've been to Saudi Arabia, Shanghai, Hong Kong, you know, uh, Italy. It was just, I love traveling. But I have found that, um, that I actually get more out of it if I can s sort of standardize some things of what I do. Um, and so I will bring TV shows that my wife and I watch and other things. And I have the same habit um, at night, no matter where I am. And it just kind of like, it just, it keeps me connected back to home. Um, and it's silly, but in a weird way, it, 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 that stability allows me to fully be there and enjoy the variation. Um, so that I don't end up going to my McDonald's in like Shanghai, just so I can feel a touch of home. Right. Awesome. Thanks for that. Okay. Question number six, what is one thing you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? So I, this will sound like a really like, well, duh answer, but I absolutely hate working out, like hate it. Like, I don't understand. Talk about motives. I, I don't, I, I just, but I realized like, you know, at some point, like the traveling, the writing, the things were just, I was, it was, I was becoming unhealthy. Um, and so what I did was knowing my own micro motives, because I, I literally, like even today, I, I've had a personal trainer for two years. And if I could take a pill <laughs> that would give me some a decent body and that, cause it, really it's more about health, I, I would quit that so fast. <laughs> like, um, and so what I did was uh, I, I tried to like internalize my own writings and I said, okay, I know I should want, I know I should care about this, but I don't, right? I have my own gym at home. I don't use it. <laughs> like, so what I did was I did, there's no kidding. Um, prepaid to the trainer, all these sessions. And then there was this, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like this website. So you put a bunch of money in um, to this thing and the trainer has to connect and says, so they said, what's this thing that you hate the most? Oh, is this and dot com? I believe so. I believe so. Cause That's like, I, it, so what I did was like, and for me, it was um, Donald Trump's reelection campaign. Oh, okay. yeah. I don't mean to be political. I just like, you know, yeah, whatever. For me, that's like, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I just was like, yeah, no, that that's definitely not the world I want to live in. And I'm, I'm, I'm rapidly independent, but that's not the world I want to live in. So if I, if the, if the trainer didn't log in and say, I did the session, then each time a $50 donation was made to his reelection campaign. Turns out that is incredibly motivating. Right. Um, so I did that. I got, I, I, I got into training and then I used this tool to be able to maintain a motivation <laughs> that just wasn't there otherwise. Well, that is really funny. I've, I've had somebody else tell me about this and I'm just looking at it right now. <laughs> it's, wow. I, it's funny. Like I, I first thought if I prepaid that that'd be good enough, but then I realized that I had enough money that losing $120 a session, I was like, eh, <laughs> like keep it keep it, you know, and, like, and that's not, that's not motivating enough anymore, but, uh, but funding things that I actively dislike turned out to be very motivating. That is great. I, I suspect there are multiple services like this, but the one, as I mentioned that I've heard of for anybody listening who might want to try that to get the leverage they want or need to achieve their, their desired goals is stick.com with two K so S T I C. <laughs> but smart. That's smart. Okay. So question number seven, what is one thing you wish every American knew? Well, this will sound like a cheap plug, but we just finished um, this private opinion work on American, it's called the American Aspirations Index, looking at the trade-off priorities that Americans have for the future of the country. People believe that we are profoundly divided. They believe it. Um, and then when you get into the private opinion, it is just not true. It is shockingly not true. I was blown away. I mean, 
I don't care if we're divided. Well, we, I, we can deal with division. We can deal with common ground. We can't deal with misunderstanding. We think we're divided. We are not. When you look at the top 10, top 15 <laughs> highest aspirations we have for the future of the country, they are shockingly similar across race, class, gender, geography, and even political ideology. Um, the biggest threat to us is we don't we don't realize that. We actually think, so for example, um, the, the in the aggregate, the third most important priority out of 56 for the country was addressing climate change. It's also, it's even a top priority for Trump voters. They just didn't, they didn't believe it was. So there are certain things where uh, the illusion creates its own consequences, right? And in terms of what it means to live in a great society, like we actually have a hell of a lot in common and it is only this illusion that we don't that is going to destroy us. So I wish I wish Americans understood just how much their fellow citizens share their values. Because one of the most important predictors of sustainable free societies is social trust, right? That gut feeling, can most people be trusted? We have been in free fall in the US in terms of social trust for generation over generation. The moral foundation of all social trust is shared values. No kidding, right? Obviously, if I, if I want to be positive, some I think you you see the world as zero sum. Why would I trust you, right? So we have the the moral foundation for social trust right in front of us, and it is only the illusion that we have nothing in common that is holding us back. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, I'm just making a note for myself here. Now you know why I'm excited that I left Harvard because I get to do cool stuff like this. Like literally, whatever it is that I want to know, I have I have the most amazing supporters who are like, we trust you. They they invest in us and let us pursue these things uh, against the goal of driving toward a positive some society. I, I literally wouldn't trade my life for anybody's. Wow, that's great. That's that, and what a great thing to be able to say. So what I and I of course we got this recorded, but just here for my own. Uh, benefit what i wrote is the moral foundation for social trust is shared values is that the ro rock solid research and, and 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 how sad is that that at our core values we actually share them in common and we don't realize it yeah there, there's so much here and uh, so i'm gonna blow up my own lightning round for just a minute um a couple things i think about i think about steven pinker's book the better angels of our nature Mm -hmm. And about the opening sentence in there is something about we live in a safer time, but no one believes it. Like the no one believes it today than it's ever been before. But most people don't believe that. They believe it's the opposite. Because because fear sells. Yeah. yeah. And with in terms of our values and our collective illusions, it is social media. I look, I, I'm look. I think it. So I, I'm not one of those. Oh, technology is terrible. No, look, technology is great. You kidding me? But there are unintended consequences, which is this. Our brains aren't terribly good at, at figuring out what we think the majority thinks. We, yep. we confuse noise for numbers. And so social media allows very, very loud, loud fringe elements to masquerade as consensus. And in fact, you know, what's interesting is some folks out of Clemson just finished some pretty amazing research on uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election. They didn't do what we think they did. What they did was they created bots that went into liberal Twitter and bots that went into conservative Twitter. And instead of propagating lies, they found the fringe views for each group and then retweeted the hell out of them. So that if I'm conservative and I'm in here thinking, wait, I thought we were about like low taxes and small government, but it seems like we're all talking about <laughs> like something else. So now my identity, if, if, I'm, if it's wrapped up in my politics, I'm likely to conform to what I think Republicans care about. Same thing happened with liberal Twitter, which those things don't overlap. It's pretty crazy. And what they did was they drove a false view of extreme, right? So we're all conforming to extreme views that we don't actually share, drives us apart artificially. They're clever as hell, but we've got to understand what technology does to us, the unintended consequences and take responsibility for that. Yeah, it, it is remarkable. And, and also there's this whole dynamic, you know, cause there's all this about technology and communication and, and so forth that maybe amplifies some of these tendencies mm -hmm. as well. I'm also like, as you share this, um, I'm also reminded of 
I read in a book by Tasha Yurik, who wrote a book called Insight, where she talks about, you know, self uh, awareness is both understanding yourself, your preferences and and desires and things like that, but also understanding how other people see you. Yeah, and it's it, a great and, book, huh? And we're not a we're not great at knowing that how we look from the outside, of course, because we're inside ourselves. So yeah. very personal, but it's also writ large. You know, it's interesting, very interesting. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to get us back, get back on the question set here. Uh, just a few more in the lightning round. So question number eight, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? I believe that it's about leading with a spirit of generosity, that intent matters a lot. And when we come in and we think about things in terms of transactional, like what can I get out of this? It doesn't end well, right? And it kind of folds back into my ridiculous sort of optimistic view of humanity, which is I think people do bad things. We're all capable of that, but it's usually circumstantial, right? It, and and we all have the capability for good. So if you orient to relationships, you treat those relationships as sacred, you avoid transactional thinking like the plague and lead with a spirit of generosity. And even when, even, look, w w I learned this at, at Weber State, my mentor, Bill McVaugh, who's since passed away, he saw something in me and he invested in me in a way before I even saw it in myself. And I know this is too long of an answer, but I'm still going to tell you, you can cut it out if you want, but like he, um, <clears throat> When I was gonna, um, when I realized I was a decent student, and they, be grad school could be for me. I was working selling fence and going to school, trying to feed my kids. And um, he said, "Listen, you, you have a you have a future, but you you're going to have to commit to this." And he said, "You just need to be on campus all the time, and you need to do research." And I told him I didn't have the money to do it. And he said, are you willing to sacrifice? I said, yeah. Lo and behold, about a week later, I got a call from the psychology department. And they said, hey, we have this research assistantship that just opened up. And it turned out to be just barely enough money for me to pay my bills. I should have been, I should have been suspicious that it was like literally just enough of my bare minimum, which I had told Dr. McFaugh. I only found out later that he offered to teach a fifth class and then donate the money back to the department so they could hire me. But he didn't want me to know. So I would feel obligated to him. And when I found out, I, I asked him, you know, cause he was so good about investing in so many students and a lot of students, even at, at the time I was there, didn't really, didn't really do much with it. They, 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 they took advantage of it. And they didn't, I said, how do you, how do you, how do you keep that going? And he said, you know, it's because of people like you. Yeah, look, nine people might not take it, but but one person does, and, and that makes all the difference. So look, that's what I think about relationships in general. Lead with the spirit of generosity. Sometimes people will take advantage of that, but you will be shocked at that vast majority of people do not, and it will enrich your life and their life. Wow. What a beautiful, what a beautiful act of generosity. Robert, did you say his name was Robert? Was your mentor? Uh Bill McVaugh. Oh, Bill. What a, what a wonderful act that was. Holy cow. How did you learn? How did you, did he tell you later or did it, how did it come out? That uh, No, the department chair told me and she said, he doesn't, he would never want you to know, but she said, you know, you, you care about him. I think you, you want to know that this is the lengths that, that, that these people go. I mean, how amazing is that? So yeah. that's why for me, man, when I, when I think about the education that I was fortunate to have, ah, I'm sorry, Harvard doesn't hold a candle to Weber state. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Question number nine is about money. And it's aside from compound interest, what's the most important <laughs> thing you've ever learned about money? That the idea that it doesn't buy happiness is only half true. Money, this idea that we have to pretend that it's not important, right? This is why I go back to Seneca. <laughs> like, he, he, he said, look, you need to learn to control it, right? Because here's the truth. Money buys you security and it buys you choices. If you don't know how to make those choices, then money is a net negative, right? You probably were better off without it. But if you know how to make those choices, then it can be a net positive, right? But 
now I'll get to the, the cliche thing. There's only so much you need. Come on, right? Security and options, choices, right? And 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 past that, it's not really going to do you much. But 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 so there's that middle ground, right? Like if you think money is going to make you happy, you're going to be miserable. If you think it doesn't matter at all, you're probably going to be miserable too. <laughs> like, so there's that 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 middle ground that I think is critical. All right, thank you for that. And question number ten: If people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, assuming you want them to, you're okay with them doing that. What would you have them do? Shoot me an email. Uh, contact at toddrose.com. Um, it'll get to me. I look. I can't talk to everybody. It's, I, I wish that that's the hardest thing, right? But but I'll tell you, like, I, I love I love getting to know people. And I think like you, like, you know, a lot of my stuff is sometimes I have to give one to many talks, but like, I, I just, you know, it doesn't matter where you go. It, you know, there's something about our common humanity that is just so inspiring. Like, I'll, I'll t- let me tell you one sort of thing, just because, you know, why not? I'm chewing up scenery, right? <laughs> like, um, but uh, I, I was in Taiwan and I'd never been, it was my first trip to Asia. And it was actually off of my book's square peg, right? Which was just about all the screw up I was as a kid. That's largely so. Like, spoiler alert, you know. Um, and I get to this auditorium, I'm giving a talk, and there's a line of basically mothers. I mean, I, like, I feel like a rock star. It was up this massive auditorium, seats 10,000. Seriously, it was just ginormous. Wow. And, um, and mother after mother, came up to me and just said like that well, I didn't speak their language. They didn't speak mine through a translator telling me how much I was just like their child. Right. And it's just like, you're just like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Like we're human beings, right? We're distinct, but we share something in common in our humanity. And that's why I just love, like, there's nothing better than getting to know people. Nothing, you know, at best, it reinforces your view of humanity, or at worst, it reinforces your view of humanity. At best, it actually like reveals something and teaches you something that you wouldn't have known any other way. How's that for like, that's got to be the longest answer to how do you get, how does someone get in touch with you? <laughs> uh, it's all good. All right. And the last thing before we leave this um, lightning round is as an expression of gratitude to you for sharing so generously of your time and, and your experience and your wisdom with me and everyone listening, I've gone online to kiva.org, the micro lending site, and I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to a woman entrepreneur named Elmira in Kyrgyzstan. Mm. It's 35 years old. She's raising four kids. She has a high school education. Her family's main source of income has been raising cattle and growing crops. Um, so she's going to use this to just support in, in the work that she does. So thanks for, can you, can you tell me who that was again? Yeah, her name is Elmira, and I will Elmira. send the link after. Will you send me the link? Yeah. I, it's, I, I, I want to join in that one. That's yeah. just amazing. So thanks for for giving me a reason to go to go do that. I like to think that Thank our you. conversations benefit uh, even more than just anyone who might find this on the internet. So Love it. Love it. Just think, think what Elmira can accomplish, right? Yeah. With people believe in her, invest in her. Yep. Okay. Well, with that, we've come to the final portion of the interview. Um, just a few questions for you about writing, the creative process, uh, this kind of thing. And of course, we've touched on it a few times. You talked about you never saw yourself as a writer. Some of the books that yeah. have helped you out there. Now you've written three books. You've got a fourth almost done. You might have written more than that. Probably a lot of papers and things too. A lot of papers. Yeah. A lot of papers. How has your... Let me ask you about who, who, who has been influential in your development as a writer and what's the influence that they've, they've exerted on you? So this, I'm going to go back to Karl Popper and I'm going to tell you why it's really weird. Cause he's like the only philosopher that I'll ever quote. He was a philosopher of science. And I already told you like his book was amazing in terms of changing how I thought about myself as a scientist. But he he talked about how he wrote, because I find his writing compelling. And this is what he did. He had a position, right? And rather than making a straw man out of the out of the other side, 
he wouldn't start writing his own stuff until he wrote the most full-throated defense of the view he was going to actually go after. And so he would write that view and he would send it to people who held that view and say, does this represent your view? And until they were like, yeah, absolutely, this is, this is the argument, he wouldn't publish it. Because he felt like it was in nobody's interest for you to make straw men and then try to, you know what I mean? Like, and the reason that was important to me is, you know, I, I feel like this is going to sound cheesy, but I think we have an obligation when we write, you know what I mean? Like, and, and you want people to trust you. Like, it doesn't mean I'm correct, right? I am certainly going to be wrong about things that I've written. I hope I'm wrong about things. Like, how boring would that be? If it were, but, but I think we have an obligation to respect readers, to trust that it, they, they can handle nuance, that, that um, it's on us to make it compelling, but we don't make it compelling by minimizing complexity, right? We make it compelling with better prose, right? Like, but um, I don't know, that, that just stuck with me because it, it told me from the very beginning that it is critical to respect the reader. And so I used to think that just meant don't dumb it down, but I think it means more than that, right? I think it means you owe them an understanding of the nuance when it's there and even the other side, um, not just a straw man to make your case. Mm. Interesting view. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. How do you, how do you see the process of writing a book after now having completed, you know, at least in the last four, like, cause for me, this experience of writing is it never gets easier. No, <laughs> so, no. like creating a book, you probably learn shortcuts or th ways to be efficient or you know, things to avoid and things like that. But how has your process changed? Assuming it has, how's your process changed book after book? I know what my, I know the process that gets me the book that I'm proud of now. So I, that's, what's changed in terms of learning the right kind of strategies, which I mean, truthfully, you write a book. I, look, I never imagined that I'd write a book, let alone two best-selling ones. I mean, I'm proud of that fact, but I just like, <laughs> that was not talking about like ignoring your destination. That was never a destination for me. Right. But, um, but I, for me, um, I know what that process is and it doesn't get easier. As you said, like right now I'm on, like, it doesn't, I, I when I write a book, I spend a lot of time coming up with the ideas. Um, I give myself a lot of space. I know that if I don't have a killer story, first of all, I have something really to say, I'm not gonna write a book, just write a book. I, I don't want, want to be that kind of author. And then you get into the writing process. Um, it still takes me a year to finish a commercial book. Like it, it, it hasn't gotten shorter, right? But the process is less painful in the sense that early on, I wondered whether this was, you, you know, like I've never had a book writing process where the thing I thought I was starting to write is actually what ends up being written. It's pretty comical, right? Like, and you have to lean into that, right? So having a good structure in place that allows you to know full well that, that like, don't find anything too precious that like be open to the idea that the discovery as you're writing, um, that means like better ideas. Like I'll, I'll give you an example right now with collective illusions. And this was, I was not thrilled about this. Um, I gave the draft to my editor. I had a three part structure. I'm like, listen, I know what I'm talking about. And she was like, this is terrible. No, she didn't say that, but she said like, it's just takes too long. She's like, I think you should move part two to part one. And I was like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, right? Like, who are you to tell? Like, I think like, I've like how I felt, right? Mainly because I'm like at, at the end of a year of writing, and you sit there and you look at it and you go, "Damn it, she's right." Move stuff around, rewrite a bunch of stuff. It literally takes another two weeks of re-editing, but that kind of stuff just happens, right? And so that process. The other thing I'll tell you is get a trusted group of people. As you write, you can stay in your own head. That's a disaster. Cause you're just, you're just ricocheting around your own errors. <laughs> like it's, you need some people you trust. And I have a small group of people that have orthogonal skills, right? I don't want an echo chamber. I want different 
points of input. And the last thing I'll say, and this was a, a former editor of mine, in terms of the, the feedback process, because you need that, it'll make your book better. Listen to the criticisms, but don't necessarily listen to the solutions. Like usually they'll they'll they feel something when they're reading, and that's probably accurate. You need to listen to that. But that doesn't mean they necessarily know how to solve that, right? Yeah. So so I think that's a critical distinction. Yeah, I've I've heard something like that before, and it's always good to hear from someone that has like applied that, right? You're saying it's not just it's not just theory. Um, okay. Let me think here about writing. Um, how do you how do you think about telling stories? This is I love a, telling stories. This is like anyone who draws. I I don't draw, but I hear like hands are the hardest thing to draw. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like in writing dialogue and story, mm -hmm. right? When it's done well, it's wonderful, but it's, I, I get this. How do you think of it? I love storytelling. I'm actually better at storytelling than I am about di than dialogue. So I usually get help with dialogue. Um, and I'm working on it though. Um, to me, uh, I, I'm a big fan of show, don't tell. And I like, this is probably giving away too much, um, but I, I have, I'm pretty formulaic in that I just like to jump into stories. I prefer, I prefer jump, get me into a compelling story that I just am so captured by. Then tell me what I should have thought about. Don't, don't, now I'm going to tell you this. And then I'm going to tell you this, just start telling me, right. Um, my, I'm the most proud of end of average, I believe has some of the most killer uh, opening stories of an intro. I, I'm, that that's the book I'm the most proud of of, of the editor. Although uh, I'm, I, I believe this next one on Collective Illusions will give it a run for its money. That's great. I can't wait to read it. And by the way, storytelling. It turns out we we understand good storytelling all the way back to Aristotle. Like it's like just the, the, I'll say the last thing I'll say is I I found it even um, I gained a lot in storytelling by learning. Um, I started reading up on screenwriters. Because, mm -hmm. because they have almost no space to write. Like you think about how, how little room you have to tell stories. So they have to get rid of everything that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that uh, much more informative that you take it into narrative nonfiction where you've got a little more room to breathe, but it's always better to learn how to do it in the most punchy way and then expand out. Um, but it doesn't necessarily work the other way. Yeah. Let's see. The next thing I want to ask about writing, we talked about storytelling. Oh, it's about you, how you manage your, how you structure your time, right? Do you, and what, what routines, what habits you have when it comes to the writing process? So, um, because I run the think tank and I have, we have another company, like I, I write, I, I write from four 30 in the morning till eight every day and I write on the weekends because I just don't, I, I mean, I prefer to be able to have, use the, most of the time during the day, but it's definitely my side gig. So, um, and for me, um, I and this is following sort of riveting reports approach. So the way I think about it is, you know, I've got the book and I've got the chapters because I, I like the structure, the constraints make me more creative. And then, I'll take a chapter. Okay, what's the point I'm trying to make? And and I'll, I think of obviously all writing, the paragraph is the unit of writing, really, at the end of the day, right? And so I know that like a given chapter that I'll write, because I want a book that you should be able to read. If you go on a cross-country flight, you should be able to finish it. I, I just think there's no reason to write a longer book, but um, <laughs> and that's, I'm sure there are reasons. But like, so a chapter for me is going to be about... 7,500 words, like about 80 paragraphs, give or take, whatever. Um, and so then that helps me because then I'm like, okay, what are the beats of this chapter? And I'm not going to start writing until I know this. And I will like kind of structure it and be like, what's the killer opening story? If you don't have that, you don't have anything. So I will spend a lot of time on that. And then I'll structure it because now I'm at a paragraph level. I know the constraints. You're only going to have 
three or four big ideas that you can hit in that. So suddenly what was this kind of colossal big project can be narrowed down to like, what's the story here? What's this? And I, I'll spend a lot of time with story structure and narrative arc um, before I'll ever write a word. Because I feel like once I've locked into that and I, I feel the commitment there, and I think this is a great story and I think it's a great study, then I can write. But if I do it the other way, I'll start writing and I spin my wheels and I'll try to make a paragraph do too much or a section do too much. So that's my process. And I will, um, if I find myself kind of stuck writing, it almost always means there's a problem one level up. So I'll step back. So right now, um, if I was to show you on my laptop, I literally keep a, uh, actually, I'm, I'm just going to show you. This is this is way more than you want to know. But um, I keep a running uh, document on in Google Docs of the entire flow of, well, you're not going to be able to see this. But anyway, Collective Illusions. This mm -hmm. is literally the book that you, Okay, that, that's paragraph level structures and sections because I want to be able to keep tabs on the high level story structure right? so all the way through within chapters. Those are all chapters and paragraphs. So because you can get into the weeds and you just lose yourself. I need to come up and think about like, wait, how does what I'm saying here fit in the rest of this? So I, I keep that dual track that allows me to be able to, to keep tabs on that high level structure. And when I get bogged down in writing, I'll come back to this and say, oh, you know what? It's because I'm trying to make make this idea work here and it's way better over here in a different chapter. So I, for me, it, that might seem like overdoing it. it is, it's everything for me. Yeah. No, I, I can see that I can, I got so many thoughts that come up and, and first of all, thank you for sharing that and showing that. Um, one of the thoughts is this idea about right? Like this works for Todd and I suspect mm -hmm. this could work for many people. And we've ultimately got to find what works for us. It's exactly right. Because it's funny. Um, my, my colleague who's writing a book right now, I'm like, Hey, look, and this is so funny. Cause this is, I should have known better. It's her first book. And I'm like, Oh, listen, I've got the process. And I'm like, this is how we think of creating it. And I'm walking her through it and it's just not working. And she's like, you know, I don't think this process works for me. And I'm like, oh, duh, of course. Like, why? Like, good, we tried it. So yeah. now let's start with who you are and think about maybe there's other examples that would work better. It's humbling, right? It's like, I should have known, but I get so locked into how great this strategy is for me yeah. that I just assume it works for everyone, which obviously that's not true. Yeah. Now, the other, another thing that it comes up for me in this, um, isn't it wonderful? and sometimes just puzzling how the brain makes these associations, right? But I'm, I'm thinking of that documentary that came out a couple of years back, uh, Free Solo of Alex Honnold's mm. climbing. Oh my goodness. I, how, I, I couldn't, I was like, my palms were sweating. How do you, like, what in the world? Yeah. Like, and and, the, and my wife, she had a grip on me the whole, like, night oh. or whatever. But, but the reason that comes up for me is I'm just thinking of how thoughtful he was on literally every every place he was going to put his hand and his foot climbing that face. And to me, how deliberate you are in thinking through the whole structure of the thing is just that meticulous, you know, ness in, in, in preparing the climb. It's really yeah. At least if I fail, I don't die. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, yeah, no, to, to me, it comes back to look again, people may not like my books. That's okay. Uh, people may not, I might be wrong sometimes, but what I do control is how much respect I have for the reader. And what I hope comes through is that deep respect. Like, I, I think I have something to say. I have something I want you to believe. Then that's incumbent on me to make it as relevant and meaningful to you, right? So part of that is doing my job and preparing and making sure that in the way I write, it doesn't make it harder for you to connect with. Um, and, and picking stories that are likely to resonate with a wide range of people, these different stories. To me, that's all in service of, of when I'm done with a manuscript, I genuinely feel like, did I actually do my best to connect with audiences? Because if I don't, I, again, I believe I have something to say. So it's on me, not you, to actually make it work. And the thing I, I absolutely hate when people say, look, if you start a book, you have to finish it. That is, in my mind, the worst possible advice. 
it is my job to write something that is compelling that will make you want to finish the book, yeah. right? That that it's weird that we put the obligation on the reader and not the, not the writer. Yeah, for sure. What? Um, so you just showed us Google Docs. I'm curious if there are any other tool oh, yeah. technologies that you have found that have made this either more enjoyable or more effective. Absolutely. So um, the Google Doc I only use to keep track of the high level thing because I I get to make comments to myself. So that's the only way I use that. I use Evernote for all research and summary stuff because it's got such good search capabilities and you can link within it. It just, it really works for me. Um, I use papers to store all PDFs and everything because of its annotation capabilities, my tools like that. Um, I've tried Scrivener forever because it's supposed to be better for writing. It just doesn't, God bless them. I'm sure it works for somebody. It's just a little too complicated for me. Um, so, and then there's just good old fashioned word, right? Like that's the only problem with the word is it crashes too much to be reliable as a, like, you know, I just literally crashed on me a couple of days ago and I lost about, I thought it was auto backing up and it didn't. Oh, wow. And uh, so I lost about half a chapter rewrite. Um, oh, so. Sorry that happened. That's <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's just, it's just the sacrifice to the writing gods. That's how I think of it. That's a, that's an empowering view. <laughs> well, good. It's interesting for me to hear you talk about the paragraph as the unit of writing. I would have thought it was a sentence. One paragraph, one idea. And once you realize that there's only like three ways you can construct a paragraph. And then once you figure out what that approach is for that paragraph, then sentences are pretty simple. You only have what, like four or five sentences in a paragraph. It's like, like, that's how this is <laughs> like, I wish I could write this. Nope. I'm like that kind of like, okay, what am I doing in this paragraph? Um, yeah, that's I like that's to me, the paragraph is the unit of all writing. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I'm sure I'll think of the three other questions I, I, I should have asked as soon as we disconnect, but um, <laughs> this is, I've learned so much. I hope people uh, listening have, especially those who want to write have taken away some things that'll be useful. If nothing else, the, the inspiration to continue to persist in their creative expression. Uh, what, what advice? So it's kind of two, two questions you can answer either or both, which is what advice or encouragement would you give anyone listening as it relates to their, their, their own creative projects? Well, the encouragement is listen, keep writing and, and go back to the strategy aspect. If it's torturous, if you're feeling it's plotting, step back instead of brute forcing it go a little wider and look for there's so many books on how to write right stephen king has a decent one there's things and you can start to sample and there's not going to be one person's approach that's going to fit you perfectly so read take some time to read widely about how how great writers uh, uh, approach it and then test some stuff out and realize that as you're trying out different approaches you need to really embody them for a little bit you can't just like tinker, try it, right? It's not wasted time. We often think we got to get right into writing the great American novel. Listen, it is worth investing in, in the time to figure out a style that works for you. And it can go from feeling torturous to feeling like incredibly wonderful and joyous, right? Because I, I mean, I love writing. I love the aspect of it's a forcing function for me to get my ideas clear, right? Out of my head. Sing. But like the other thing to your first question is like, look, Ideas matter, right? Stories matter. I mean, you don't realize, we often take for granted that the things we think we know, who else cares? I mean, come on, everybody knows it. Like, that's the most common thing I hear. What do I have to say? Well, you'd be surprised, right? You'd be surprised. And, and if you think about it, <clears throat> the most important contribution you have to make is your distinctiveness, right? Like, everybody's saying the same thing. That literally benefits nobody, nobody conformity like that is it, we already know well i don't need your voice telling me the same thing somebody else is saying add your unique voice and think about how amazing it is and this might be a little egotistical but we still have relationships with writers from thousands of years ago like i feel like i know seneca how amazing is that we invented a technology that allows us to bridge centuries. 
And so you're going to write something. It may matter to people right now. It may affect somebody's life in a way that you can't even comprehend. Or it may not for now. And it may be something that someday somebody's saying that they, they're they reading you the way I read Seneca. I just, what a, what a wonderful way to offer a contribution based on your own distinctiveness in a way that could have lasting effects on people. I, I, I think that's so humbling and so exciting. And there's nothing like long form writing for that. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful thoughts and very empowering as well, right? Because we all, we all deal with doubt. We all have a challenge, whatever it is from the software crashing, <laughs> you know, to knowing which story to include and which to leave out on. We all have that. And you'll have imposter syndrome. You'll feel like, who am I? Just stop. Listen, get over it. I promise. Don't be arrogant, but just write. Like yeah. it, it's something like the world's not worse off because you did. And it might be a lot better off because you did. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful views. Um, okay. Todd, I have so much enjoyed getting to know you. This has really been me a too. privilege. Me too. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Again, my guest, Todd Rose, author of Dark Horse, Achieving Success Through the Pursuit of Fulfillment. Hope you pick up this book. If you do, I think you'll learn a lot about yourself and uh, read some pretty incredible stories. And and Todd, maybe, and, and we could do one much shorter, but uh, perhaps perhaps we could do this again after your next book is out. Comes out February 2nd. So let's make let's make a date. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education or the little conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, is designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.